Oh, hello. Welcome to today's video, which is going to be a review of the Warhammer World Anniversary Day, um, which we attended on Saturday, the 2nd of March, 2024. Um, just to explain, so every Warhammer store has a store anniversary day. The Warhammer World one is the biggest and the best, okay? Um, the tickets were free, but you had to get a ticket online for fire safety reasons, because otherwise they'd have too many people in the venue and it ran in four sessions so there was saturday and sunday and on saturday and sunday there was morning and afternoon i think they had something like 1400 tickets in total spread evenly between those four those four sessions so i'm going to talk about my impressions about my entire family so my wife and uh, little penny who you can see there in the photograph um and we went around and had a look at all the things that were to see and do and yeah buy as well uh, we're going to start with uh, shopping. I mean, it is a Games Workshop event, so there is going to be a fair old um, focus on, on buying things. One of the nice things about Warhammer World events is, in addition to the limited models that you are entitled to at the event, so normally at a store anniversary, you're going to just have two limited edition models to choose from. Uh, this year, we are, we're we looking at the Tau Ethereal and the, the, fire, the Firebeard Dwarf guy. Uh, pictures are down... On the screen there that top row of whiteboard of pictures and then you've got the event exclusive models that are going to be at places like adepticon and they're also because it's at warhammer world they're also available at warhammer world so you've got the the charging croup there and the raven warrior fellow and then the thing about going to warhammer world is that they also have they, they dig out a, a vast selection really of um event exclusive and anniversary models and things from the past uh, that they had on sale here there were one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven different um previous exclusive models that they had available at warhammer world to buy uh most of them for 21 pounds uh, you know a couple that were 22.50 ripper jackson i think is 22.50 and Inquisitor Erasmus 20 to 50, it was 21 pounds. So the big, big selection. Obviously, there were a lot of people um, scalping, right? There, there was a lot of people loading up massive baskets with loads and loads of these models who go expressly with the aim of spending their 200 pounds. Because, of course, you get the anniversary swag at 200 pounds as well. So they would spend 200 pounds on these models and then they'd eBay the models and then they'd get the swag. And some were even buying. I think there was easily there were probably people there easily spending thousands of pounds on on these models. But the the stock levels they maintain at Warhammer World, like they know this is going to happen, and they were constantly bringing out box after box after box after box after spot box of these exclusive miniatures as well. So nobody, at least on the Saturday morning when I was there, nobody wanted them was missing out. Not in the main picture, but they did have, of course have the four actually new miniatures. Uh, I didn't take a photograph, but they were around the corner at the new releases section. Um, but I've got the, co the the pictures of those off Warhammer World, so that you know what I'm talking about. Now, we didn't actually want any of these models. Uh, some of them are lovely, and we already have them. The four new ones, none of them actually appealed to, to, to either of us, so we didn't pick up any of these. I was expecting to get, when I posted this picture, I posted it to the members section of the Discord, I was expecting to get a flurry of, oh, can you just pick me up, eh? Nobody asked for anything. So we didn't buy any um, limited edition models, actually. And I, I know some people will consider that's a waste because you could easily sell them on eBay for 30, 40 quid. But um, I, I'm not about that life. What I want to say on this slide really is just a shout out for how like the shop area, especially at the start on Saturday, was extremely busy. Uh, but nevertheless, Penny insisted she wanted to get down onto the ground. Uh, so, I, so I took that little photograph because she was surrounded by really tall people. And, you know, she's one, right? Everybody was super kind and super tolerant. And even people who clearly didn't want to say, like, hello to her and, and, and greet her, you know, nobody was grumpy or angry that there was this tiny little girl wobbling around on her reins, um, you know, while they were queuing for their stuff. And everyone was super kind and super patient. So big, big shout out to the people there in the shop. And the queue was really well managed and well marshaled as well by the Games Workshop employees. And it was all actually really, really, it, you know, it was really smooth as, as things go um to buy things so what did i actually buy I didn't buy any limited edition stuff um so i ordered fulgrim transfigured 
for £175. So I really wanted Fulgrim Transfigured. I've wanted Fulgrim Transfigured since it was shown off. I, it, it's pretty unlikely that I'm actually going to hobby um, Fulgrim Transfigured this year because I have been quite slow to start hobbying in earnest this year. Right, and I've got a lot of stuff to do between the, the Kill Team Hobby Challenges and those of you that are on the Discord will know that I've signed up for some reason to take part in a a tale of six gamers thing for 40k so i've got a lot of stuff on the docket and i just bought a lot of chaos warriors so i've got a lot of stuff on the docket that i'm supposed to be building and painting i don't know if i'm going to find time to do full grim transfigured but i want to get around to him at some point maybe it's going to be next year and it's just that first of all forge world models are never going to be discounted so unlike spending 200 pounds on like regular games workshop product where in the back of your mind it's like mm, i could get 15 to 20 percent off this right forge world stuff is never marked down um and also obviously buying it on this day you get a pile of, of, of free merchandise and stuff for purchasing and spending the money on the day so that's cool um it was slightly vexing that i had to do an in-store order uh when at warhammer world and i couldn't just take my full grim transfigured home with me on the day right but at the same time i will say um you know, the guy in the Forge World store did go and actually look in his stock room and be like, no, we don't have any in the stock room. They do have them in the warehouse, so I can order one for you. So we did it that way. You know, the ability to count Forge World stuff towards the sort of spend X amount of money, get goodies promotions, like store anniversaries, but also the £60 monthly retail coin promotion, used to be exclusive to Warhammer World with their Forge World store. I will point out that actually you don't need to travel to Nottingham. If you plan to pick up £200 worth of stuff from Forge World at some point and you fancy the anniversary gear, if you wait, can wait till your store's anniversary, you can now. One of the great things about the new website, possibly the only truly great thing about the new website, is the ability to order Forge World stuff via your Warhammer store's in-store terminal, and therefore qualify for any of these kinds of promotions with, with Forge World stuff, which does make it a bit easier. Um, and then Helen, we need to spend another £25. We spent an extra 36 instead. Helen picked up the Grail Knights Command, who are direct only, but again, you're in Warhammer World, so they're on the shelves, which is nice. Um, uh, so that's what we bought. And then buying all that stuff entitles you to some freebies, right? So... Um, with it being an anniversary, it was like, spend 50 quid, you get the pin badges, spend 100 quid, you get the pin badges and the neoprene dice tray, 150 was the pin badges, the neoprene dice tray, and the measuring widget, and then 200 pounds, um, the pin badges, the neoprene dice tray, the measuring widget, and a backpack, backpack. Now, I love, I love, 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 love swag, merch, whatever you want to call it, I know, um, it's funny when, when, um, Nightfall came over to the UK for the, the Kill Team event uh, and we were chatting like he's like really like unmoved shall we say by the concept of merch he's like oh that's just merch I don't want that give me some t give me some free miniatures I'm interested but all this branded stuff he like he doesn't care for it right but that's fine and I guess he must represent a, uh, a demographic of people that don't care for merch but me personally I think it's really, really cool I like having all this bits of swag I'll quite happily go to places and go to work with my Warhammer backpack on like I do not care I think it's great it's not like what I especially like if I'm being perfectly honest is some of the some of the symbols that they used to use on the merch would be a bit um they could be misinterpreted, and they've gotten wise to that now. And generally, you see this, you just see this really cool Warhammer Hammer logo thing, which doesn't look like anything other than the logo for a really cool company that makes really cool toys and games. So, as as, as a marketing change for that, like, because the Imperial Aquila is a bit of a because because it calls back to various real world symbologies from 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 places like that. You know, that was always a bit weird. Do I want to go around wearing a shirt with just a black shirt with a white eagle on? but the warhammer logo no i'm absolutely fine to wear that everywhere that's cool um so yeah glad to get all this stuff um the pin badges obviously i don't really care for blood angels i might even give that blood angels pin badge away to a friend of mine but i have just bought a huge pile of chaos warriors so i was really happy to get a chaos warriors pin badge that's gone on my uh my one of my brush rolls here all my all, not like all my pin badges but like a few of my pin badges that most closely represent the various things I actually collect go on the go on the brush rolls so that's gone on there 
uh, the kill team, well, not necessarily kill team, but the metal measuring widget with the Terminator and the Stormcast to turn on is just, I don't know how useful it is for 40k and Age of Sigmar, which is what it purports to be for, but it's certainly really useful for kill team. I much prefer the feel of the metal measuring widget that was originally a, a kill team like freebie for pre-ordering Octarius in store, if I remember rightly. Um, but if I ever, I ever lose my Octarius one, I've now got a replacement which has, uh, which is a bit more uh, interesting, and um, because less people will have one, and also has the same lovely tactile because it's very thin, which is nice. Whereas the plastic one's a bit chunky, uh, so I really like that as well. That's good. And the dice tray, you know, I have a dice tray. Uh, I, I always forget to take my dice tray anywhere. I have like a leather dice tray that folds flat and that you snap together. This is a neoprene dice tray that folds flat and that you snap together. It is about the same size when it's flat as the new the the new plastic carry case lunch box thing with the fingers inside that I've reviewed on the channel. So it's a nice size. Um dice trays are really, really good. I'm not in the habit of using them because as 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 Zimbad will tell you, the, the little kitchen table, dining room table thing that we play kill team on at my house, there's not that much room around the sides for like a dice tray. So we end up rolling our dice in the middle of the table like uh you know it's nineteen ninety nine. But that's just what we that's just what we do but I, I do understand why people would like dash trays and I, I really should take one when i go to events because you know events are warhammer world and the not to kill the events there's always loads of space around the table so you've got plenty of space to put your dice tray down which is a, a good thing and a backpack backpack really nice really like the backpack really good backpack um and it also stacked up with the the coin promotion of the month so again helen and i between us managed to get a spend 60 pounds in this month and get this coin coin ever since they were doing coins we got like almost three full albums of the collectible coins um you get one every time you spend 60 pounds in a month until that store runs out so spent 221 quid right uh, so I've got three coins, three Dark Angels coins, so one for our collection, and then I've got two extra Dark Angels coins. Thankfully, I know two people who are absolutely loopy for Dark Angels who will be reasonably happy to receive a, a little Dark Angels collectible coin without having to go and spend 60 quid of their own money in Games Workshop. Yeah, I know, I could sell them on, 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 on eBay for 10, 15 quid. I know that, right? You don't need to tell me in the comments, but I don't... Again, I'm just not about that life, right? I, I don't... Selling stuff like that to try and make a profit just would make me feel mm, un, un, unhappy, right? Uh, so yeah, that was that. I want to talk a little more about the bag because I really uh, like the bag. I really actually was impressed. So um, I generally don't like backpacks. Uh, I'm not a backpack wearer. Generally speaking, I find because I'm a massive guy. If you ever met me in person, then and you'd be like, "Wow, he's really really fat." You wouldn't say that out loud, but I bet in your brain you'd be thinking, "Wow." He's really, really fat. Because of that, I often find backpacks, like, if you ever see a picture of, uh, like, a dad picking up his little kid from primary school, and he's put the little primary, like, the little Peppa Pig backpack on, and the straps are too small, and the straps are, like, bursting out, like, here, and the little backpack's sitting in the middle of his back, that's how most backpacks feel on me when I'm wearing them. This backpack actually has really long, like, adjustable straps, so it's really comfortable. And it also has all the mod cons that you'd expect from a backpack that you'd pay for. So it's got the side pockets for the water bottle. It's got a little laptop holding thing in the middle, or I guess you could put a big hardback rulebook in there, right? And it's got a front zip pocket that folds all the way down, and it has the standard little... Sta I've never seen anybody use them, but, you know, it has the standard little stationary thing for a couple of pens. You can slide your phone in there if you're some kind of whoever the space aliens are they'll take their phone out of their jacket and put it into their backpack so it can more easily be stolen i don't know but if you want to do that you can put that in the little meshy bit it's all there for you right so actually and it feels really strong and really robust like i'd have no problem uh if i you know if, if my work briefcase broke right and I, I needed a work bag um i wouldn't actually have a problem doing it. you know <laughs> Would I take a... Plenty of teachers do take a backpack to work as their work bag. Would I take a plastic backpack to work? I'm a little bit old school, so I like a nice little leather like leather briefcase. Not not like a hard attaché case, but like a soft briefcase. But that's just because I'm a bit... <laughs> I'm a bit that way. But in general, if I had the kind of job where I was going to wear a, ba a backpack, I wouldn't have a problem with this versus one that I paid for, like 30, 40 quid to pay for a backpack. So it is. it's a nice... It's not cheaply made, is my point. It doesn't feel like a free gift. Right, so that's nice. Uh, be great for tournaments and stuff as well. If you had a load of rule books and some water and some lunch and loads of things that you wanted to carry around, 
Yeah. No. It's a, uh, genuinely a nice thing. So we got this store anniversary bingo card, which I've put on here to remind myself mainly of the things that you could do. What you could do is get these challenges ticked off, and then you've got a £5 voucher. Not really worth doing, because it's a £5 voucher that's only redeemable on a selected starter set or boxed game product. So you get the Kill Team starter set, for example, £5 off. The problem is... Because they've gated it so it's only it's five pounds off those particularly high value items, the percentage discount isn't any good. So you end up um, spending more money than you would if you bought the same thing from Element Games, right? Like you're not you're not going to make fifteen percent off getting five pounds off a starter set. Now, if it had been a five pound voucher, so you pick up like a can of spray for a pound, amazing, definitely would have done it. Which is precisely why they didn't do it that way, right? Uh, but you could fill this bingo card off ticking up the, the things to claim your £5 voucher. You could paint and take a miniature. I didn't paint and take a miniature because it was literally, if you go into any Warhammer store any day of the week, you can paint and you go, oh, I've not really done Warhammer before. Can I paint and take a miniature? You, It's the same too. It was like the Space Marine and the Stormcast that they give away for free in their thousands. Like there's specific models they have for new players. So there's, I'm not that interested, especially with Penny there. I'm not that interested in sitting and painting something badly with their limited selection of paints and their rammy brushes to paint something but loads of people were doing it so that's nice i've done that kind of thing before or how well but usually only if it if it had been paint and take like a brand new miniature or the miniature of the month or an unreleased miniature or something like that that would have been cool but it was it was just the starter models i can't be bothered with that um there were four fun like and i want to say if you ever been to old games day like in the 90s and early thousands where they had these ridiculous fun mini games where they weren't really anything but they were just fun and they used games workshop models they had four games like that they had gargant football speed freaks racing full tilt and the eximus incident so we managed to play two we managed to play full tilt and the eximus incident i have a feeling we've played gargant football before They've had Speed Freaks Racing before, but I know that we've played it before. So they have these four like mini games. They also had loads of open gaming on table, like with White Dwarf Bunker game scenario sheets out. So if you brought your own models, you could play a game using one of these scenarios if you wanted to, or just play whatever you and your friend wanted to play. Yes, you could go around the exhibition because the tickets were free. If you want to go to the exhibition, you want to pay five pounds. And it was just a case of five pounds is a great price for the exhibition if you've never been around there before. Because I go to a lot of tournaments and a lot of events where exhibition entry is thrown thrown in for free, um, I didn't feel the need to pay to go around the exhibition because as far as I can see, since I was last there, they haven't really put in any big new displays or anything like that. So that was that. Was that. There's a hobby challenge. Now, the hobby challenge was a paid extra ticket. Basically, the, it's like the scrap demon from... Um, from from uh, uh, Warhammer Fest, right? Really, really fun at Warhammer Fest. We probably would, we definitely would have done it at the open day if we hadn't had Penelope with us. And then it was like, well, um, you know, baby doesn't want to sit there all day while me and mum build miniatures, so we didn't we didn't go in for that. But I'm sure it was great for those people that did do it. Uh, painting contest, yes, we entered that. I'll talk more about that later. Um, uh, on another slide so yeah we did the painting contest as well easy bugmans yeah we did that i'll talk about that they had F kill team live the laser tag experience that they've been carrying around they had it at fest they had it in a few other places i'm not really a laser tag person right i'm a fat cripple so it's not really my thing we had a baby with us i offered to mine penny if helen wanted to do the laser tag but she didn't want to do it by herself so we didn't do the laser tag. Um, the 40k cosplay group were there, right? So there's a big 40k cosplay community that come to all these things. They're also at Warhammer Fest. They were at the previous um, anniversary day. They're really cool. They put a lot of effort into their hobby as well. And that's really cool to see. And there were some new models to be revealed as well, uh, which I'm sure you've already seen on Warcom. Let's talk about the reveals. So I took some pictures. Um... My pictures are a bit high resolution, but then they're also through glass and in the kind of harsh lighting of the cabinets. So I, I took some pictures. I think you want to look on Warcom with some better pictures. So we got a custode in an orc here. Um, if you've not read the Warcom article, allow me to educate you. It seems basically the custodes and the orcs are getting uh, releases for 40k 
it seems like after the dark or the dark angels are done after the tau we're going to get the custodes and the orcs they are going to be of the one one model in a box um with a codex and that's it right so you're getting a new model and a codex the model really annoying me is going to come out first lock inside a box interestingly the orcs one to get this new orc mech the box contains like loads of orcs and a truck and a stomper which is 85 quid so if you really want this orc you're gonna have to really look at the price on that box especially if you, if you don't particularly want a stomper and my understanding is a lot of people don't want the stomper it's not a popular thing it's not very good in, in games so um it's gated behind quite an expensive purchase potentially or they could be offering the stomper at a massive discount i mean the christmas box set for world eaters offered angron at a massive discount so we will see um i think both these models look really cool there's been some cons cons um, some talk on the internet that the custode looks a bit short um i don't know if i've captured him from a, a slightly different angle compared to the one on warhammer community look, i don't think he looks particularly short Maybe he does. I don't, I'm not very good at that sort of thing. I'd have to see him. Excuse me. I'd have to see him next to you know a bunch a bunch of other custodes, right, to really judge. I will say he doesn't look particularly interesting. Like the the orc mech looks quite individual. The custodes guy just looks like a custo like I can tell it's a custodes character, but he doesn't jump out at me as being different. To other custodians characters particularly i think he's supposed to be a lieutenant analog right that they invented so it makes sense that he's not that much more blinged out than the regular guys but at the same time he does just look like a custode with um a hat so yeah there's this really weird thing that if you didn't if we weren't in games workshop you wouldn't necessarily think this was a games workshop product so they made a blood ball team of garden gnomes Again, there's far better pictures on Warcom, and they've got a they've got a goose, they've got a little fox, they've got a snarling badger. Um, <laughs> I think this must be an attempt to bring in, like, use Blood Bowl to maybe bring in a different customer base that isn't all about the grim dark because these are not in any way grimdark these are whimsical this could be a children's product right there's nothing there's not even a hint of edge to them they're just these little cool gnome men with 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 big noses and um a goose right so so it's yeah i don't know weird it's a weird release it's not 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 for me but then i don't even play blood bowl so it not being for me is of no never mind if you enjoy this i i'm not going to yuck your your stuff that's that's fine you enjoy it it's there for you and i'm pleased but it just it does it's it's a it's a definitely a new direction for games workshop right and blood bowl's been kind of doing pushing this weird stuff like i remember this started when the, they did a blood bowl undead team and i was moderately cool it was like oh cool a blood bowl undead team and then it was like a blood bowl undead team but it was all themed around like american halloween stuff it was like yeah, our Blood Bowl's just got permission, I think, to do weird and wonderful stuff that isn't something you'd see, I think, in, in mainline games. There you go. Um, then they've did... Also, this is a... I thought this was a Warcry Warband, right? It's not a Warcry Warband. It's just... It's the Chaos version of the, the Callus and Toll set that they did. Um, so it's just a, a warband for Age of Sigma that's based on a Warhammer Plus animation. I'm really sorry that the, the main character in the front there on foot isn't in focus. Like I say, there's better pictures on Warhammer Community. But I really thought this was a Warcry thing. Uh, I'm reading the Warhammer Community article, apparently not. So it's just it's just like a, a narrative set, like 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 Callis and Toll was, and like the um the other the, the this is the third box in a run of warhammer plus animation based uh war cry releases right and they must be doing pretty well but that seems like a, a real niche like age of sigma is already i think less popular than 40k and then we know that warhammer plus people quite a limited number of people are actually watching it so but there you go but i like these miniatures on their own merits especially i like the one on horseback and the horse is looking really cool i like the way the horse has a skeleton head like tied onto his face um but it is itself just a basic horse that's quite nice uh yeah i think they look really good um absolutely 
just a brief interlude into the you know people that didn't click on this because they're like, I don't want to watch a review of a uh, um, Warhammer event. Ugh. Um, we're going to talk, talk about rumors and stuff and hype and, and and stuff. And if I'd led with that, the video got more clicks. But whatever. So this is the state of play currently with the old uh, master spreadsheet of rumours. This comes from last Warhammer Fest. Obviously, all these things in green have been released. We've got things that were supposed to be released before the end of February that are now late. We're still waiting for Nightmare and Pyre and Flood. They've both been previewed, but they've not been released. Dark Angels are out now. Okay. Uh, we've now seen preview of the Orcs, the Custodes, and the Tau. And then you can see here, these are the things that are supposed to be coming out March, April, May that haven't yet been previewed. I mean, arguably, we've had a 30k resin character. Like, the 30k roadmap was really super vague anyway. Like, yeah, we're going to do resin upgrades and characters. It's like, well, have you done them? We don't know how many characters. We don't know how many upgrades. Um, but we know we haven't seen the Legion Command Squad in plastic or the Melee Weapon set in plastic. So, 30k resin characters and upgrades, maybe that should be yellow. It's hard to tell. Um... So yeah, we, we then we've got, we obviously know for 40k what's coming June, July, August, but then all the others have run out of roadmaps, and then we've got no roadmaps, but these are things that have been previewed that are out there in the world, so Warhammer Underworlds, Dawnbringers Book 5, Callus and Toll, the Orcs and Goblins Book and Box of the Old World, uh, Gunnar and his Oath Brand, and the Blood Bowl, Glimmed Arrow Groundhog, so these last two are, are from this reveal, right? Now, we're getting another set of reveals on the 20th of March. It's Adepticon. Adepticon's probably their biggest show this year, right? Because they're not doing Fest. And Adepticon was always... I'm not going to say Adepticon's like the biggest games workshop. Like, it's not the biggest American event because arguably the LVO is bigger. But Adepticon seems to be the one that Games Workshop go bigger at in my... And I'm not American and I've gone to none of these events. But the impression that I get from sitting over here is that we get a better preview at Adepticon than any of the other events. So, I think it's likely we'll see Chaos Marines. I, I, are we expecting, like, a big release for Chaos Marines, or are we expecting, like, a codex and, a, and, a, and one thing? I know that I kind of expect to see new plastic Chaos bikes for Chaos Marines, just because, like, the Chaos bikes are from 1066 at this point. Um, I don't know what else Chaos players are really expecting, I'm guessing it should be a bunch of new stuff, right, rather than rehashes. Um, so we shall see. Maybe they're going to do Legion upgrade sprues in the, you know, may maybe the Night Lords that are supposedly coming for Kill Team have paved the way for um, a bunch of upgrade sprues to come out, like a w w Word Bearers upgrade sprue, Alpha Legion upgrade sprue. That'd be kind of cool, but that's just total speculation. Um, yeah, and then. Maybe they'll fire the starting gun on Hype for Age of Sigma at Adepticon. That see, like we assumed they'd do that at Warhammer Fest. Warhammer Fest isn't happening. I think they might view Adepticon as the next big thing after Fest, right? So we'll get the the reveal. Yep, there's a new edition coming. This is the box. This is exactly you know, it'll be like like Fest was for 40k 10th edition. It'll be the full reveal of everything that's gonna be in the box. We were expecting um, Stormcast versus Skaven. I don't know if that's still too early, the 20th of March, given that we expect it to come out in the summer. But I think, at the very least, I'll do a teaser for the new edition of Age of Sigmar. Right. We might even get reveals for the next uh, Kill Team set, which we expect to be uh, High Fall, right? Gene Steeler, Cult Brood Brothers versus um, some kind of Leagues of Votan. It wouldn't be unprecedented for them to preview that whilst Nightmare is still unreleased, right? As much as I will complain about it on my channel, it, it, the marketing department don't seem to be being affected by the slowdown in the logistics department, which is an interesting decision by Games Workshop. So maybe we'll see that. Same deal for Warcry. Pyre, I don't follow Warcry as much, but Pyre and Flood's still not out. Maybe they'll start showing the next Warbands for Warcry anyway, just because marketing department knows no breaks. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see soon, right? The 20th. So it's, uh, you know, what, 17 days away at the time of recording? I shouldn't have said that because I don't quite know when I'm putting this video up. But it's soon, isn't it? So, um, obviously they haven't done the... They, they, we know there's an Adepticon preview because the Adepticon website has told us they haven't done the Warhammer community by the way, the next preview is at Adepticon, because that article will tell us what systems are going to be featured in the preview, which is nice. So once that goes up, we'll talk some more, right? Especially if Kill Team appears. 
One of the other big activities at the event, back to the event, this is a video about an event, was eating in Bugman's. Um, they've changed the menu at Bugman's um, again. So let's just go through this very, very, very briefly. So they've got, hang on, let me get the, the laser, laser pointer here. So as far as I can tell, the breakfasts, if, if you're fond of, of, of the breakfasts at Bugman's, they haven't desperately changed. You've got a full English breakfast. So two bacon, two sausage, hash brown, mushroom, baked beans, fried egg, a slice of fried bread, and a slice of toast. I feel like they used to do an enormous breakfast and a smaller breakfast, but now there's one breakfast, vegetarian breakfast, the build-your-own breakfast option, um, which ends up not being cost-effective. And then you've got new, I think, is build-your-own waffles. Hello. Your own waffles, three waffles with butter, with your choice of toppings: berry compote, maple and agave syrup. Because pure maple syrup is too expensive, I guess. So you've got to get the agave in there to make us all really pleased. Bacon, fried egg, banana, uh, whipped cream, um, and I guess you could have them with everything on if you wanted. I'm not sure berry compote and bacon go together. Uh, some people think maple syrup and bacon goes together. What? Just let me know. If you're in Bugman's and I want to know, what would your waffle combination be? Let me know in the comments, right? And are you from America or Europe? Because the Americans are far more fine with the idea that you can put maple syrup on bacon. And I don't know how many people in the UK love that combination. But a theme through this window, through this whole look at this menu, is going to be that um, Bugman's have bought waffle irons. <laughs> So we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Um, personally, if I was going for this, I mean, if money was no object, I just might go full sweet on it. I might go for the maple syrup, uh, banana, and the whipped cream. Right, that's three toppings. That's quite expensive. Um, but I think a savoury, a savoury waffle is something that is quite new. I think to the UK as a concept. I know it's very popular in America, and I know we're quickly becoming a monoculture, but it's still something that people in England feel is a little weird I think right so let, let's alter our waffles in the comments and really uh, confuse people that haven't watched the videos give me your waffle like uh, would you put bacon and maple syrup together on a waffle would you put bacon on a waffle full stop let me know let me know it's only going to get more intense when we look at the rest of the menu uh, the, the bacon cob is still there so bacon cob sausage cob bacon and sausage cob vegan sausage cob bacon and sausage cob my go-to for a pre-tournament um breakfast uh yeah i would love to get some, if anyone from bugman is listening you do black pudding right you do black pudding it's up here black pudding can you not just do me a bacon sausage and black pudding cob because that'll be perfection anyway i love a bit of black pudding uh they've got their various bugmans the bugman stormcast which is a bugman 6x didn't sample these things because I had to drive. I, I could have had one and still been okay to drive, but I was um, heading back to drive all the way back to Colchester. And then in bottles, Bugman 6X, the Hammerhall Best, the Twin Tailed Ale, the Lord Brock, and the Talia Gold. These are different, right? They've changed these around. They're, I think they're all new recipes. They were in all new bottles. So if you've tried Bugman's beer before, I think they've changed it. Um... The next time I'm in Games Workshop Warhammer World, I think it's going to be on Good Friday. And I will only have to drive back from Warhammer World to the Travel Lodge in Mansfield, right? So I may get a little glass of the Lord Brock, just because I like a porter. So I'll give you a, I'll give you a review of that, and I will uh, let you know my thoughts. And as I review uh, the, well, it'll be re the review for the Easter uh, uh, Not Kill Team event, but... Uh, because I'm going to Warhammer World the day before, because uh, it's a bank holiday, I'll, I'll tack something on there. we got soft drinks and, you know, the, the new soda soda floats now, which is interesting. No, soda folk, right? Soda folk. The, the, basically, they've stopped doing Fentimans, which, uh, as you'll know, is a bit of a meme on this channel. And they've replaced it with these soda folk beverages, which is definitely a choice. Definitely a choice. Let's go. This is going to be the biggest, longest part of the video, right? Reviewing the Bugman's menu, but there we go. Um, <laughs> that's Fat Man doing a Warhammer channel. Gonna talk about the Bugman's menu. Gonna talk about the Bugman's menu for days. You can skip forwards right until the slide changes. It's not that difficult. 
So we got sandwiches, we got the ultimate grilled Reuben. This is actually what I ordered on the day of the tournament, right? Because I'd had a McDonald's breakfast, so I didn't want another burger. Uh, it was pretty good, right? So you got your pastrami, was obviously preformed pastrami from a packet. It wasn't like American style pastrami where they slice it off the big old pastrami brick, right? But the sauerkraut actually couldn't detect any sauerkraut loads of house pickles which was mainly pickled red cabbage swiss cheese and sriracha mayo but it was quite nice uh, my lovely wife had the spicy nudger toasty um actually we had half and half which we shared uh, that was quite nice if you like the nudger sausage but it basically the sausage was so flavorful it the cheese and the pickles and the barbecue sauce may as well not have been there it just tasted like a nudge sausage on toasty which is fine um they do like a margarita toasty they do a children's menu look at this so you got sausage and mash fish fingers veggie burger for your kids you can have fried chicken tenders on top of a fluffy waffle served with baked beans and maple syrup now there's something going on there <laughs> I just want to break this down for a second. There's something really weird going on here because Americans don't eat baked beans, right? Typically, correct me if I'm wrong, Americans. Americans typically don't eat baked beans. Brits typically don't put maple syrup on a waffle if the waffle's being served with savoury food very often. But I would I would consider it especially disgusting, surely, for the bean juice and the maple syrup to combine that's not is that okay like i don't want to dwell but is that okay we didn't order it so maybe they're in little pots and you just have to build like a little wall of chicken nuggets and have your maple contained on what if the dam breaks oh, i don't know it, mm. and why are only the children subjected to this maybe the logic is that kids won't care <laughs> right and then there's what penny actually had which was grilled cheese toasty four cheese toasty on white or brown bread which is good served with fries and baked beans far too much food for a one-year-old right but they don't have like a really little ones menu you know um she ate like i want to say two-thirds of the cheese toasty and like four chips yeah you know good time was had um but it would be nice I realise it's probably not worth doing, but it'd be nice if you'll get like a half portion of the things on the children's menu. If if you know, like a, a menu for kids that are aged like one to five, and then like a menu a menu for kids that are aged like six to eleven, right? So where like the one to five year olds can just pay half of what's on the children's menu and have half a portion of what's on there because you did not touch the beans you not need a beans you not need a whole portion of chips just the grilled cheese on its own would have been splendid you know but you know beggars and choosers so their loaded fries have become loaded tater tots but they've got the classic it's called more grunter tots but they've always had some variation on bugman's pulled pork bacon and house about house pickles in this case but on tater tots now instead of chips nacho tots which have nacho cheese jalapenos pickled red onions and crushed tortilla chips and pizza tots with marinara sauce grated cheese and basil and pesto and if i don't know where i stand with loaded chips because they always feel like you pay 10 pounds and they've got so clearly got the calorie content to be a whole meal but then they feel socially they identify in my mind as a side order I don't know. Right. Sorry, we're going to have waffle talk again, right? So, this is the adult version. I know the chicken. I watch, like, sorted food on YouTube, and it's these hipster guys from London, and they, they, they are have their finger on the pulse of what people are eating. So, I know that English people are eating chicken and waffles now. I know that's become a thing over, like, the last two or so years. Now, so this is, like, warm and fluffy waffles, double stacked with bonus fried chicken, smothered with lashings of buttermilk, cider gravy, and topped with a fried egg. That sounds delicious. That's clearly an anglicised version of American chicken and waffles because they know that most English people are not going to put maple syrup on chicken. Unless, apparently, they're a child. And then they have the... I really want to understand this waffle thing. Right? I, I demand waffle-related comments. 
what's your view here you can get a steak i don't i'm a steak a steak snob so there's no part of me that's getting a steak from bugman's because it's not going to be good enough for me right there you go Loaded naan bread, so you can have a stone-baked naan bread with your choice of spiced lamb kima, tikka halloumi, or falafel, plus curried grains, lettuce, pickles, onions, cucumber, tomato, and garlic mayo. Sounds pretty nice. Um, the next time I'm going to be in Bugman's is actually on Good Friday, and so as a Roman Catholic, I don't eat meat on Friday. Well, I, I'm not supposed to eat meat on any Friday, but like super especially on Good Friday. So I'm probably going to go for the loaded naan bread with the tikka halloumi. That sounds pretty, pretty banging uh, for a vegetarian choice um, to me. Balti pie and mash, you know, uh, so it's it's a curry, uh, a vegetarian curry in a pie with mash, minty peas and gravy. Minty peas are grim though, so your mileage may vary. And a cumberland sausage ring served with creamy mashed peas and cider gravy. I kind of want to order this to find out if it's the same Cumberland sausage ring that they serve in the staff canteen. Because in the staff canteen, they do a really good Cumberland sausage ring spiral thing. Or if it's a different Cumberland sausage ring. <laughs> Just curious. You can get a salad, right? It's like a build-your-own-salad thing. That's, I need to speed up, because how many minutes am I going to spend talking about the Bugman's menu? But there you go. Maybe they're going to watch it, and they're going to want the feedback. You get a burger, right? You get a Bugman Stat Burger if you want too much food. And this is coming from me, a fat man. Like, it's a six-ounce Aberdeen Angus beef patty, patty, a grilled chicken breast, a barbecue pulled pork, a mozzarella on a brioche bun with onion rings. It's just... I don't need a beef burger and a chicken burger. And a beef burger and pulled pork's fine. A beef and chicken and pulled pork all on the same burger is a bit much to me, maybe. Um, a French-Canadian, a petzl bun... Bugman's fried chicken fillet, smoked bacon, maple syrup, French cheese. Sounds like a really good chicken burger. Yep, go for that. Big Lion breakfast burger, pork sausage patty, fried egg, smoked bacon, hash brown, brioche bun, served with a side of barbecue beans. Like, where is the black? If you're going to do a breakfast roll thing where you put black pudding on it, you weirdos. Black pudding is amazing, and they sell it. It's on the breakfast menu. It's right there. Why don't they just put it on more stuff? Black pudding. Uh, also, with skin on fries, upgrade to tater tots to what for one pound thirty? It's an upgrade to tater tots. An upgrade. If someone said you want chips or tater tots, you'd be like, "Well, I'm not in the school cafeteria, so I want chips because I'm an adult." Maybe that's just me. Then you can build your own burger. You can put things on it, but you can't put black pudding on it, right? Uh, so beef, chicken, or a vegetarian patty that they've called Moving Mountains in a brioche bun where and then you get the salad and it's not really a build your own burger because all you can add is bacon and or mozzarella like it, i feel like build your own burger is really reaching there it's i want a beef burger and then you can have bacon or cheese or both build your own burger or you can have a hot dog in the style of blood bowl apparently bratwurst sausage sauerkraut french is american mustard tomato ketchup and crispy onions again this is an englishman's hallucination of what american hot dog is i'm told in america they don't put ketchup on hot dogs and that's just something that we think they do again america if you when you finish telling me educating me about waffle cuisine let me know if ketchup belongs on a hot dog i and then they've got this weird attempt at tapas so you can get small plates you get some buffalo chicken wings some pulled pork tacos that actually look really good because pineapple salsa nachos some plain tater tots some onion rings coleslaw mexican street corn which i feel like needs some explanatory text mac and cheese bites some fries by themselves and a large garlic naan God, this is more about Bugman's food than you needed to know, wasn't it? It took me a long, long time, right? We're talking about this than any other topic, I'm sure. But, you know, if you know the, the Bugman's team, please pass the video on. And then, just because we, we're not done, they had a, uh, a special. So they quite often have specials on when they um, have events, right? So for sixteen ninety five, you could get yourself a beef burger with buffalo sauce, 
bacon and cheese, mac and cheese bites, onion rings on a brioche bun with chips. All things from the menu, but just in a combination for 16 95 And like I said, we went for toasted sandwiches. Good. We can actually move on from talking about... I mean, myself really, thank, thankfully, it's dinner time soon. As soon as I finish this video, we're going to start with dinner. So that's good. Um, and we're having burgers, so that's even better. Uh, Legends of Paint, right? <laughs> Let's talk about something sensible. Um... Living up to every stereotype, being an overweight man, just waxing on about food. So, both Helen and I entered Legends of Paint, and we were both awarded a bronze pin. We were both awarded a bronze pin. Helen's bronze pin not pictured because she has already put it in pride of place somewhere else, right? Two really good things about this event, right? First of all, there were unlimited prizes. So, a common complaint I've heard about, like, Golden Demon and... I'm not like back in the day um the idea of golden demon was they would have the bronze the silver and the gold standard and the bronze people would get the bronze de the, but, but there was also a limited prize so to get the gold you had to come first in your category to get the silver you had to come second in your category and to get the bronze it was third in your category and I'm told the problem is with um golden demon now and if there's any real professional painters in the chat and they can find space in between all the waffle comments, they can let me know if this is true. But the idea basically is that you can go to Golden Demon and there'll easily be like half a dozen entries that are just uh, jaw-droppingly amazing. And it's really hard to pick them apart, right? So what they've tried to do with Legends of Paint, there are infinite prizes. So there are sheets with standards on we don't get to see them but i kind of glanced at one upside down briefly on the judge's desk to get an idea of what they've got they've literally got like these are the features of a bronze model these are the features of a silver model and these are the features of a gold model and they award pins and as if you are a bronze model as you know you will get a bronze pin they've got infinite to give out right now this doesn't mean not like i will say it's not a participation award i'm actually quite proud of getting a bronze pin not everybody got one you know, there were models in the cabinet that didn't meet the standard for any of the pins, right? So that's quite a good way of doing it. The second thing that was amazing about this is that you got three to five minutes feedback from one of the two heavy metal painters that were judging the um, that were judging the event, right? So they could tell you what you could do to improve to go from bronze to silver or silver to gold or from, from, from nothing to bronze or whatever you want. So... The feedback I got, because I entered on the left here, my, my Lamentus captain, you've all seen my Lamentus and, and I've heard me, they finally won a painting award, or one of them has. Um, so the feedback I received, he said that this is absolutely down the line what we expect, like, this is this embodies a bronze standard miniature, like it's really solidly bronze, which I, I damning with faint praise, you know, I don't know. Um, he said that the face was really, really good. Um, he said that the colour choices and everything were really, really good. Um, you know, uh, the way I put them. Thanks to Zimbab for for that for making me settle on the purple for the for the for the um, fabric. Right. Um, he said that the the gradient on the cloak, like the the, the blending on the cloak, needed to be more subtle, more thin layers because it was quite kind of harsh and stripy. And then he also said that they like to see a really like thin, stark, tidy highlight. On, on the cloth as well. Now, I think I have issues. I have cerebral palsy. I have all kinds of different things. If anyone's ever seen my handwriting, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a really good painter, I think, in spite of these issues. But one thing that I think I'm really going to struggle with, if that's what they're looking for, is really thin, crisp highlights. Because I just can't... I just can't seem to get that level of brush control but you know it, it is what it is i think that's also the case with my armor uh you know the shading is good but the the highlights they're not those thin and if you look at heavy metal miniature you know they're not those thin and crisp like really stark and really crisp highlights it's not really my style i guess by design he did say the face was really really good i really like the color choices and the composition and the choice of model um, and then the other thing he said was that the some of the checkers, and not from the angle I've photographed it out today, but some of the checkers were a bit messy. And it's true that the checkers, I didn't get them perfectly right. I, I chose something really, really difficult um, to do, and it's not perfectly executed. Which makes me wonder if I would have gotten a higher score if I'd done an Imperial Fist Captain instead and done a slightly simpler 
uh, freehand thing that was more perfectly executed. Like, I don't, <laughs> I, is a diff, but, 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 you know, I don't paint to win painting competitions. I paint to fulfill myself and to have models to play with in the games, and then I, I hope to win a painting competition with those models. So it's not my main factor when I'm painting miniatures, if that makes sense. Uh, but it was really nice to get the feedback. I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed that it was actually critical feedback, and it wasn't just, oh, yes, everything. I hate that. I hate the culture that we live in where people are scared to give feedback, right? Really lovely to get feedback from professional painters. Um, yeah, so that was Legends of Paint. Highly recommended, and in many ways the highlight of the... Well, no, not quite the highlight of the day, but a certainly a highlight of the day, right? The cosplayers were there, and uh, we've seen all the cosplayers before, but many of them had new cosplay, not the Marines. The Marines, I felt like the Marines had all seen before, but the guys that cosplay in non-Marine, like they had new stuff that was really nice. It's really interesting, to, like the 40k cosplay crew have been at more and more events, um over the last couple of years. Most of these guys, as far as I can work out, aren't employed by GW. They're just GW, they're just enthusiasts that come and they add so much to these events. Although I'm not like there was a battle sister uh, in a really nice um Canon S Viridian cosplay, right? Manning a till downstairs. So some of them are Games Workshop employees, but I don't think being in paid to, to cosplay, which is really it's fascinating because it adds so much to the Games Workshop's event and these guys are just doing it for free because they're lovely people and they want to be here. Now, I put this picture on because Penny was really, really taken with this one tech priest. He had really cool glowy eyes and she thought that they were absolutely fantastic and she went up to him two or three times and she had a little Black Library sampler. You can see it clutched in her hand there, right? This little orc sampler that was free and she kept handing it to the tech priest and he actually opened it and pretended to read to her from it. Really nice guy. I think he was a guy. <laughs> you can't actually tell under all that stuff. Uh, really nice though, like like playing with the little kid. Brilliant. I was so happy and thankful that, 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 that you know, it's not like going to Disneyland where these people are paid to wear costumes and interact with children. I was really pleased that someone who was effectively just, you know, a hobbyist expressing his hobby and his love for Games Workshop was also just willing to interact with my daughter in such a really splendid way. So I don't know if this guy, I don't know this guy's name, and I don't know if he's ever going to watch this video, but like, wow, thank you. Like, you made her little day as well. That was amazing. Cheers. Um, there's loads of really nice costumes. There was a guy running around in like an orc costume that was like, partially made out of a morph suit who Penny alternately feared and loved. <laughs> he, like, scared her a little bit first, and then she kept kind of wanting to go up to him a little bit, and he was really good, really in character, and he kept warring. He was really... There was another family behind us in the queue with a bigger kid, and he was really good with them, and he was, like, yelling at this other kid and then getting to carry his gun, and they're just really great guys, and you'd think that they were being paid professionally to act as well as to just make the costumes, and that was really, really cool. Um, participation games. So we played in two participation games. First thing we did was we played the classic game, uh, Full Tilt, right? And we actually got to play on the table for Full Tilt that they built for the Warhammer Plus Battle Report. So if you've watched the Warhammer Plus Battle Report or if you've seen this picture, which you've all done now because it's on the screen, we actually played Full Tilt on that table, which was pretty cool. Um, so it's a game where you do a joust, right? Three knights per side, and you've got cards, and the cards are hidden in your hand. I will link to the Warcom article with the rules in the description if you want those. Um, I won really decisively, just not because of any particular skill, but because Helen just had really poor luck. Right, and I got a fancy certificate to blue tack up on the door. There's a picture of my fancy certificate, tournament champion, full tilt. It was great fun. It was really great fun. Not uh, as fun, though, as um, the Eximus incident, which I think actually was after the painting competition. Or no, actually, maybe more so than the painting competition was the highlight of the day. Uh, it was like a mad multiplayer kill team. I mean, I, I love kill team. It's a kill team channel, so the kill team thing's always going to be popular with me. But it was a mad multiplayer kill team zombie survival game on, on four sets of Into the Dark Terrain. We played it for over an hour much to Penny's annoyance. I think she fell asleep halfway through, and then Helen was having to ask the guy, Duncan, who was running the game, to like move her models for her, because she had this sleeping baby on her. Um, 
in our game all four players won which apparently didn't always happen i was the least likely to win like i was the last person to get onto you had to find an item and then get to a lift in the middle while these waves of zombies were constantly spawning and i only really got on there in the end because helen having rescued her one guy like with the rest of her eldar was like helping me to try and clear a path to get my guy and all this was because the guys on the other side of the table not to have a go at them but basically they started doing loads of pvp in the middle right even though they still both won they started doing loads of pvp in the middle and ignoring all the zombies that were spawning so then they left on the on the first set of lifts and then there was just a massive amount of zombies between uh, me and the lift because we'd been farming our side quite good but their side was absolutely yeah chock a block uh, so massive props i want to say to duncan first of all who uh, apparently like unlike full tilt which was written like years ago and was a thing and the guy was just manning it the guy that was running this the guy called duncan had, had written the rules himself painted all the models himself painted all the terrain himself and then was like gming the games himself as well uh so he really earned his <laughs> earned his payback in that day uh but i've met duncan before met him at events i think i met him as well at the not kill team independent event because obviously work for games workshop live in nottingham probably loves kill team because he's got all this stuff so yeah yeah and it was his personal miniatures as well that he was letting random members of the public just pick up and play with as well which was pretty cool um he did share we actually didn't play the full rules that are here on the left but he did share a uh a set so if you want to play like you can you can you can use this to, to, to play the game at home. Let's just go through this as well. So it says here, the, the Eximus incident. Your your team finds itself in the bowels of uh, Medicaid Eximus, a highly secure inquisitorial research station submerged 100 fathoms below the surface of the toxic lunar sea. The station was designed to contain test subjects for the various warp touched poxes encountered by inquisitors on a mission but has recently been abandoned under mysterious circumstances setup players are split between two sides the survivors and the infected now we didn't do it that way right so he was controlling largely the infected but there you go each survivor's kill team is made up half the number of usual operatives rounding up that's what we did each deploys in one of the eight zones on the edge of the board now we were just told to pick two squares to deploy in we don't give any particular zones the infected players have 18 tokens to place face down on the infected radar blip spaces at the start of the game nine antidotes eight pox hordes and one plague marine squad so we didn't play with the plague marines we just had the tokens down um like or duncan had already put them down so we didn't know what they were and the way we played it when you flipped a token you flipped over a card from like an ordinary deck of playing cards and if it was red it was zombies and if it was black it was an antidote that's the way we used it when a survivor term first draws line of sight to a token it's flipped over if it's antidote it stays in place you picked up uh infected operatives can't pick up an antidote token uh, if it's a pox horde or a plague marine squad, the infected players deploy their operatives. So we played a slightly different version that was more scripted to be players versus a kind of an AI or a games master. Um, but, the, you know, this is written to be more adversarial. That's fine. Uh, each turning point, the side stadium you know, so activate helping with the survivors, the survivors team simultaneously. So, yeah, so when it was our turn, it was all four players do one operative, all four players do operative number two, all four players do operative number three. So one operative before switching over to the infected players. Uh, so ah, so the way it works in this version, one operative then infected, then one operative when infected. We did all of our operatives and then all the infected guys moved. Okay. Uh, survivors can choose to fight each other, but it has to be declared in advance. The players each roll d6, add the APL with the winner activating first. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, we didn't do any PvP on our side of the table, so I didn't see how that worked. At the start of turning point two, you put in more infected operatives on the board. Um, doesn't explain how that works on here. When we played it, he just dealt out more cards onto various board edges at places where he thought infected operatives should go and flip them over. So, yeah. Um, if a survivor is killed while holding the antidote, they can choose to consume it and return to the board at the start of their turning point with three wounds remaining with uh, as close as possible their previous location. So, we didn't play that rule. Um, if you were killed with it by a zombie, you just became a zombie. 
Uh, pox hordes. The Exum and Incident adds a new operative, the Pox horde. The horde's made of multiple Pox walkers who act as a single. So this was really the key thing. It was like a squad of seven or ten or five, but they acted as one operative. If you shot them with Fusilar, Blast, Splash, or Torrent, you add plus one to your attack characteristic for each Pox walker in the horde. Um, but it was interesting. So they had two attacks each for the horde. For each model in the horde gets two attacks to a maximum of seven. Hitting on fours with two, three damage, right? They moved, it says here they moved four. On ours, they actually moved six, okay? On here, it says they moved four with a free dash instead of Overwatch, fine. Uh, they We didn't play with concealed engage orders, but on here, you're playing with a conceal order, that's fine. And curse the pox. When a survivor is killed by pox, or had a pox walk to the core. We did, we did do that, yep. No defense or save characteristic, you just remove a pox walker every time the horde suffers a crit or two normal hits in the same shoot or fight i think we played it so that was for shoot but when you were fighting you removed one per normal hit and two for a crit right so slightly different um uh, you had to get to the elevator in the middle yeah this is the same as we played it. at the end of turning point five the survivor skull one vp for each operative they have holy on the elevator and three for each antidote we just had to get an antidote out so there was no scoring up of vp we just had won if you got your antidote out but obviously when you this version there's slightly more stuff going on and then at the event at the end of turn point five of a half or any survivor operatives are not on the elevator you can do an optional additional turn called sudden death one last scramble for a few more operatives to reach the evac zone remove from the kill zone each operative that begins sudden death on the elevator they have escaped during the sudden death turn the lights will shut out in the medicaid zoom as all ammunition is spent shoot actions can't be performed increase the attacks characters and weapons equipped by all infected operatives by two so we did it slightly differently on the day we had the lights go out in turn five uh so you couldn't shoot in turn five we also had a lift that departed in turn three and the second lift was going to depart in turn five or turn six we were allowed a turn six um again because we had a games master right and that was the excellent incident, and that was great fun. So, to sum up, right, final thoughts. We had a lot of fun, and I was pretty impressed with the range of things available to do for free. We could have spent more time there, right? We could have done the Speed Freaks and the Giant Football. So, you know, potentially like an extra hour, I would have thought, there. Uh, but we'd run out of time in our time slot. We did spend money in their shop and in Bugman's and on petrol, so calling it free is a bit of a reach. But, like, if you live in Nottingham... Uh, you know, you'd always go, just hang out with people, play a few games, and then just pop off home, right? It reminded me the most of childhood games days. If, like I said before, if you ever went to games days in the 90s or the thousands, um, and you'll know that the games were these funny, off-the-wall, made-up things, right? Whereas now, there's a lot of focus at Warhammer Fest on like, the various tournaments and the proper playing properly, uh, but this was kind of capturing a really old vibe uh everyone was super kind and tolerant of little penny as well which i was worried about because we did take the last one but the last one she was like a baby in arms and she was basically it sounds cruel but other parents know what i mean like the last one she was basically luggage right but this one she's she's one and a half capable of irritating you right if you're this kind of person can be irritated by kids actually she wasn't the only there were about three or four other one-ish year old children that i saw there and everyone was really kind really family friendly so that was really good so thank you to the war not warhammer community with the capital c not the website but to you guys the community of people that play warhammer uh thanks for that for, for making it a really good experience for everybody involved uh, and that's it that's the whole thing so if you've enjoyed the video do consider a like subscribe drop a comment something like that and i'll see you again next time uh have a great rest of your weekend uh, if this is going up on the weekend, I'm not going to join. I'm putting this up. Maybe on Sunday night. Maybe not. We'll see. Bye-bye. Bye-bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.